For you shall go out in joy, says the Lord, and be led back in peace. The mountains and hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees shall clap their hands. And it shall be to the Lord as a memorial. For my word shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish the thing for which I sent it. So concludes Isaiah chapter 55, the final chapter of a focused vision that spans Isaiah chapters 40 through Isaiah chapter 45. It really is an exquisite collection of prophetic work. The content itself deeply hopeful and inspiring, the language that gives it its form, well, it's pure poetry. And all said and done, this is what it's all about. The exile will soon be over. Prophesying some 50 years after the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet whose words we considered last week, prophesying some 50 years later, Isaiah speaks words of comfort and hope. And not just comfort and hope regarding some indeterminate future, but comfort and hope for the immediate present. For Isaiah, in chapters 40 through 55, is not saying, come some 70 years from now, God will deliver us from exile. No, instead, Isaiah is here saying, God is about to deliver us from exile now. Most likely dating to the years 540 to 538 BCE, that is, the years just as Cyrus of Persia was gathering power and was beginning to show signs of unstoppable strength in the region. Most likely dating to that period, these words here in Isaiah 40 through 55 were saying, in effect, Persia is really going to topple Babylon. This thing looks like it's really going to happen. And Cyrus really is going to set us free. And so we really are going to get to go home. And thus God has all the while been here with us. And so when we get to Isaiah's words from chapter 55, his words that I just began with, his words about the people going out in joy and about the hills bowing and the trees clapping upon their return, when we read this, we must understand that he's talking to the exiles about the very real possibility of the exiles going out of Babylon in joy And he's saying that all of creation will be clapping and cheering for them upon their release. And then he ends it all by saying the same God who called us into being in the first place is not done with us by a long shot. For my word will not return unto me void, he channels the Lord as saying, but will accomplish that for which I sent it. That is how Isaiah concludes this prophetic vision. And of course, Isaiah was right. For approximately two years later, the exiled community did leave Babylon in joy. And thus, for that community, the exile was not the end, but was instead the beginning of something altogether new and beautiful and lasting. But alas, we are getting way too far ahead of ourselves this morning. Before we consider the grand moment of leaving Babylon, we must first reckon with the reality of the exiles having been sequestered there for some 70 years. You see, originally beginning in 597 BCE, the exile community had grown quite accustomed to its situation by the time Isaiah came along with his words of comfort and hope. For over 60 years now, they've been resigned to their plight. And thus, in those ensuing 60 years, they'd done what the prophet Jeremiah before had told them to do. They had built houses and lived in them, and planted gardens and eaten from them, and seen their children marry there, and seen their children's children marry there, 
And they had sought the welfare of that city, trusting that as Jeremiah said, in Babylon's welfare they would find their own. And so while they had never wanted to be in exile, while they no doubt despaired over the oppressive burden of their displaced status, they had nonetheless learned in exile and gotten accustomed to a new way of doing things and seeing things in exile. And had slowly come to appreciate aspects of Babylonian life and commerce, routine and civilization. And thus we must understand the community hearing Isaiah's words in 538 BCE was qualitatively different than the community hearing Jeremiah's words some 50 years prior. For they had now been changed, shaped, formed by their experience in exile. For against their original intentions or expectations, they had now formed Babylonian friends. And some of them had established quite comfortable lives in Babylonian society. And while they still remembered wistfully their age-old story, the, the story of how God had called them into being out of nothing on Abraham's porch, and of how God had led their people out of Egypt and through the wilderness, and of how their arrival in Palestine was the mark of their eternal covenant with God, while they no doubt still remembered that story and remembered it wistfully, they had all the same begun to grow somewhat desensitized to it. That was then they'd come to believe. Those were the glory days of yesterday. They'd begun to think. Beautiful, yes, but over. And so better to get on with the realities of today. Better not to dwell on what once was because it ain't never going to be again. Well, so it was that into this reality, the prophet Isaiah suddenly emerged and sought to recall the community to its original identity. So it was that the prophet Isaiah emerged and sought to remind the community who they were and whose they were and whence they'd come and where they ought now to be headed. But you see, what was so particularly brilliant about Isaiah was that Isaiah didn't call them wrong for having learned and grown and expanded in exile. Isaiah didn't downplay the value of their new Babylonian relationships or the new Babylonian technologies they'd embraced or the new importance that they'd come to accord the well-being of their local community. Instead, Isaiah applauded them for these things and he said to them, in effect, what we need to do now is learn how to marry these two things. What we need to do now is pair our founding identity with these new forms that we've come to appreciate. What we need to do now is connect what we know now and what we value now and what animates us now with the mission for which we were originally called. And so it is then that he lifts his voice and he says to them in our passage today from chapter 43, Thus says the Lord, he who makes a way in the sea and a path in the waters, he who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior, do not remember the things of old or consider the former things. For behold, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In his book, The Hopeful Imagination, renowned Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann writes that the real power of the prophets was in their ability to speak like poets. Prophets, Brueggemann writes, don't so much spell out a vision as point the way toward one. And they do that, Brueggemann claims, by using language and imagery that makes journeying toward that vision seem possible. 
Well, so here we see the prophet Isaiah channeling his poetic voice. For what he accomplishes in these few lines that I've just read from a rhetorical perspective is absolutely masterful. Look with me closely here. First, he speaks of the community's God as the one who, quote, makes a way in the sea and a path in the waters, the one who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. And the reason he uses these images is because these are foundational images for the community he is addressing. These images are embedded in this community's DNA. These are the images of the exodus from Egypt, and thus they evoke for the listeners the fond remembrance of the way things for their community once were. It would be the same as someone speaking to Boulevard about that foundational meeting on Marion and Peggy Campbell's front porch, or about the fire that decimated the original church building or about the steeple being placed on our new sanctuary and the entire Anderson community coming out to watch it. Just as those are foundational images for our community, these Isaiah references here are foundational images for their community. But then, just after offering these foundational images, just after purposefully evoking their nostalgic remembrance, he then pivots and says, but do not remember the former things, for I'm about to do a new thing. And right here, what the uh, prophet poet Isaiah is doing is using what's called apophysis which is a fancy way for saying he is bringing up something by saying it shouldn't be brought up. In other words, he most decidedly does want the community to remember the former things, or else he wouldn't have said that. But he wants them to cease viewing the former things as if they were the only things. He wants the community to recall what God has done for them in the past, but then to imagine what that same God can therefore do for them in the future. Thus his way for explaining this new thing, where he says, do you not perceive it? God will make a way for us in the wilderness. God will give us water in the desert. Do you see? Once more with imagery from what's been before to inspire belief in what therefore can be true again. It is time for the old story to cease being mere nostalgia for us, Isaiah is saying. And time for the old story to begin informing who we can become now. For I am doing a new thing, says God. Okay, enough about Isaiah the poet. Let's now shift gears and let's talk about Isaiah the visionary. For Isaiah doesn't just leave his talk of a new thing at illusions and apophysis. Isaiah is not just some poet sitting in some quiet corner of a coffee shop or some highbrow academic sitting in his office at the back of campus. No, turning his attention to what this new thing might look like, Isaiah now pulls from their current experience in exile to cast his vision of what could be. Go out from Babylon, he channels God as saying. But when you do, when you return, quote, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to restore just Israel. Instead, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation shall reach to the end of the earth. You see, this new thing, Isaiah the visionary is explaining, This new thing, he's saying, will be continuous with the old, but it will be so much more expansive than the old. Our mission now, he is saying, will not be just to reflect God's image to our own local community in our own local land, but will now be to reflect God's image everywhere. For you see, the experience of exile had taught this community that while some of these imperious Babylonians were indeed awful, 
Lots of them were just regular human beings much like themselves, raising families, concerned about the future, trying as best they can to get things right, trying as best they can to be good people. And so through the experience of exile, their network of relationships had expanded. And thus for them, the thought of moving forward is a community. And in so doing, barring these others that they'd come to love and embrace from their community, well, that just seemed wrong. And so Isaiah the visionary says, no, 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 no. We'll not forget these new friends and these new things we've learned. But neither will we forget our original identity either. No, instead we will graft these new friends and these new things into our community. And so it was that that is what ultimately came to pass. The exiled community under the edict of Cyrus of Persia in 538 BCE, were permitted to leave Babylon and they returned to Palestine. Thrilled they were to return to the land so vital to their sense of community, but nonetheless they were now also committed to including in their community those who had never yet even seen it. A new thing was coming to pass. A new thing grown right there in the soil of the old. Well, that was, of course, some 2,500 years ago. But what happened for the exiles then is deeply instructive for us today. For like the exiles then, so too have we now, eight weeks into this experience, grown against our intentions and our expectations, increasingly familiar with our own exile. Our experience of worshiping via live stream, of watching from home in our pajamas and sharing exchanges with friends across a chat box, this once peculiar and undesirable experience has now become familiar, and in many ways quite comforting. And our experience of sharing worship from week to week with people scattered not just across Anderson, but scattered literally all across the globe, this new way of worshiping has expanded our sense of who our worshiping community is. And thus, to consider moving forward as a community now without those worshiping with us outside of Anderson seems... Well, it seems just unacceptable to us. And meanwhile, our experience of seeking out immediately pressing local needs in the community and forming ad hoc groups to immediately address those needs, this has proven quite rewarding. And never can we imagine not operating that way in the future. And the new premium placed on cultivating personal relationships made necessary by the fact that without picking up the phone or sending a text or writing an email, we won't have any relationships at all. Well, this new premium on cultivating relationships has awoken us to the reality that just showing up at the church on Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings will not be enough to meet our 21st century spiritual needs. And so like the exiles then, so too are we now learning so many new lessons because of our exile. And not just because of the fact of exile, but because of the conditions of exile. And like the exiles then, so too do we now remember nostalgically the old days, but at the same time value too the insights and skills and relationships being formed here now in our own Babylon. And so that is why turning at this juncture in our experience to the prophet Isaiah is so very important for us. For Isaiah now speaks to us across the distance of 2,500 years, lifting his visionary voice with poetic words every bit as applicable to us now as ever they were to Israel then, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He who spoke boulevard into being on a screen porch and he who prepared a way for her through the fire. 
Thus saith the Lord who built his sanctuary at 700 Boulevard and who brought the entire city of Anderson out to see its steeple place to top it. Behold, saith that same Lord, now I am doing a new thing. Do you perceive it? Yes, I will call you out of Babylon, out of exile. But it will be too light a thing for you just to return to 700 Boulevard. Instead, I will make you a light to all nations, an expanded community, a beacon at the corner of Boulevard in the world, a people reflecting my image here at home and all around the world. Yes, saith that same God, I will bring you back to this land of promise, to this place where particular people at particular times for particular reasons have been dedicated and baptized and married and buried. Yes, I will bring you back to this land of promise, saith the Lord. But now with a commission to share that promise with people all over the world so that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Friends, the day is coming when we will be released from the exile of COVID-19 and allowed to return back to this promised land from which I now preach. But when that day comes, it does not mean that we have to forget all that we have learned in these trying and exhausting days of exile. And it does not mean that we cannot bring back with us insights that we have learned here in exile. And it does not mean that those who cannot come back with us physically cannot then be part of our community that returns. No, we have learned too much about ourselves in these eight weeks. And we've gained so many new friends through this time in exile. And we've undergone such a broadening of our sense of purpose because of these current conditions. And so it is then that like Israel too, so is God calling us now to something new. Something new born from that which has always been. If you have been worshiping with us from outside Anderson these past eight weeks, or even these past 18 months, know this. We've learned through this experience that you are not just watching us from afar. You are worshiping with us as part of our unique community here at Boulevard. And so if this is you, we invite you to send us an email so you can become part of our email list. Send us your prayer concerns so you can join us in praying for one another. Join us via Zoom on Wednesday nights for Bible study so we can learn and grow together. Say hello to us right now in the chat box and introduce yourself so that we can embrace you the way a community embraces one another. We invite you to join your story with ours so that we can truly become a 21st century worshiping community together. Meanwhile, for those who will be able to return with us here to this place, plan to return inspired to re-envision who it is that God is calling Boulevard to be now. And meanwhile, know that whoever we become will surely grow out of who we've always been. And what's more, that whoever we become will surely have been formed by this time here in exile. For the day is surely coming, says the Lord, when we will return in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before us shall burst into song, and all the trees in the field shall clap their hands. Do you perceive this new thing? I sure hope you do, because it's true. For as Isaiah says, the word of the Lord, The word that came to Moses in the desert and the same word that came to those saints gathered on Mary and Peggy Campbell's porch. My word says God will not return to me void, but will accomplish that for which I sent it. May it be, O Lord, may it be. And all God's people said, Amen.